Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rita Excel and I'm the Executive Director of the Australia and New Zealand Driverless Vehicle Initiative. I'm really excited to bring to you our next chapter in our AdviConnect series, where we're um, going to be hearing from uh, two learned professionals um, from across the globe uh, about the safety and ethics of connected and automated vehicles. I think you know these days more than ever the um, the safety of this technology, but also the ethical programming of this technology is really critical. So I'm really pleased. Um, Long-term supporters of Advi, uh, Nick Reed, uh, through various roles that he's had with various organisations, and also um, uh, Professor Tanya Lehman, who's been one of our initial partners around that sort of ethics and legal approach to automated vehicles. So I'm, we're going to hand over to Nick and Tanya. They're going to run you through the various projects they've worked on um, together and also individually. And then we'll have some questions afterwards. And please use the chat box if you haven't located it. Um, you'll have some time during the presentation. Uh, so I'll be moderating the questions. So without further ado, I'll hand over to uh, Nick and Tanya to take over. Thanks, everyone. That's great. Thanks very much, Rita. And uh, hello, everyone. And first, uh, maybe just to in invite Tanya to, to give a quick introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tanya Lehman. I am a Dean of Law here at Flinders University in South Australia. And my particular area of focus is the intersection between law and emerging technologies with a particular focus on future mobility. Brilliant. Thanks, Tanya. And yeah, for myself, um, Nick Reed, founder of Reed Mobility, independent consultancy working here in the UK to deliver transport systems that are safe, clean, efficient, ethical and equitable. And um, in my previous roles, uh, to, both with members of ADVI, uh, Head of Mobility R&D at Bosch, and then I was Director of the Academy at TRL, Transport Research Laboratory in the UK, where I led connected and automated vehicle research. And what we're gonna be talking about today is um, related to the work I did for the European Commission, producing recommendations on the ethics of automated driving. Um, and then we were very, I was very kindly introduced to Tanya by, uh, by Rita through ADVI um, to help us uh, place those recommendations into a legal context, but we'll, we'll get right into that. So uh, just to start off, um, yeah, just wanted to start, I mean, this audience, I think more than any other is probably gonna be understanding of this, this picture. So I, I won't need to go into it into too much detail. Just to say, I, I think we are coming to the stage where there are commercial deployments of automated vehicles, whether it's, it's Waymo in the US and, and their efforts in, in uh, Phoenix and, and now San Francisco. Uh, or in the UK, so there's a picture there in the top centre of um, an Oxbotica vehicle, Oxbotica leading um, a lot of the, the trials and, and tests of automated vehicles here in the UK. Um, but then you know, shifting further to the right, I think there's been an emphasis more towards the, move, the movement of goods rather than the movement of passengers, particularly over the last um, two years, 18 months. Uh, and, and I think that a sense that a lot of the first commercial deployments will be associated with with the logistics sector rather than necessarily the, the vision for robo taxis or uh, robo shuttles that uh, that we've seen um, in the trials and demonstrations to date i've been using this slide for um for, for many months now to, to kind of illustrate where where i think we're we're headed in terms of the progress of deployment of automated vehicles obviously there was a lot of excitement five Five years ago now, I suppose, uh, where we reached the kind of peak of, of hype around automated vehicles. And then, you know, as progress failed to, to hit some of the, the anticipated deadlines and with the, the tragedies around um, Elaine Hertzberg and, and others, the, the, um, the hype dissipated and, and there's a much more pragmatic sense around automated vehicles these days. But I think there's reason to believe with those commercial deployments that, um, that we are starting to turn the corner and, and heading up the the slope of enlightenment on this uh, Gartner hype cycle and you know, coming to a stage where automated vehicles will become a, a genuine um, reality. And thankfully, uh, having produced this slide, it, it's not just me that believes this. In, in fact, Gartner themselves place automated vehicles in that, uh, just starting to come up that, uh, that slope um, towards you know, the, 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 a position where automated vehicles will become um, a, a genuinely commercially viable um, product and part of our everyday lives. 
but as we as they become part of our everyday lives we need to be um confident they will behave in ways that um, are appropriate that society will accept and, and i think that what that's what drove the european commission to um recruit experts to to produce recommendations for them on the development and deployment of connected and automated vehicles so i was one of the, the groups seen in the in the picture on the slide um experts from legal with a legal background with a philosophy background sociologists psychologists engineers coming together to, to decide what are the key um, ethical issues that needed to be discussed um, and how should the european commission go about addressing them so a, a two-year project to, to you know, re meet repeatedly and go through all those issues i mean one of the first meetings we decided two things i think in particular one that the topic was much bigger than the group could ever hope to cover in the two years that we had available to us. Um, and secondly, that we weren't going to spend two years talking about trolley problems. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. that's, if you think about ethics and automated vehicles, that's one of the things that seems to have gained the most traction. And we were very clear as a group that that wasn't going to be our focus. Strangely, we sort of come back to that in the presentation, but uh, yeah, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll get into that discussion later. Um, so the report, uh, our recommendations are now available online at uh, the links uh, shown on the slide. Uh, it's very easy to read report, 20 recommendations. And those are broken into three different areas, safety, transparency, and responsibility. And um, I was in the group focused on safety, my TRL background, that's very appropriate. Um, and we came up with those recommendations there. And for this presentation, we're focused on um, our fourth recommendation, which was around when it might be considered appropriate for an automated vehicle to break the rules of the road in the interest of safety. So we think about um, the rules of the road are there to promote road safety, but sometimes there might be situations where in order to achieve the maximum road safety, you need to deviate from typical behaviors. You need potentially to break the rules of the road. Um, and in our recommendations, we, we wanted to think about how a, an automated vehicle might manage this situation. Should, w do we need to change the rules? Do we need to come up with a new set of rules that are encompassing of vehicles that are controlled by, by electronics? That might bring challenges in itself. How could we come up with rules that specify behavior in every different um, potential situation when you know the, the variability of driving is, is infinite? You know, traffic situations, weather conditions, pedestrians, um, all sorts of hazards that you might encounter. Could we come up with code, uh, a, a set of rules that encompassed all of that variability? Um, a, an alternative might be to hand control back to a, a human driver or a human operator. So in, in, uh, an automated vehicle arrives in a situation where it doesn't know what it should do. Should it break the rule? Should it um, uh, comply with the rule? But potentially lead to a, a poorer safety outcome should you just hand back to to the human driver to to make that decision well you get into all of those issues around transitions of control from automation to, to human driver can a human driver assimilate all the information they need to to be able to make that decision potentially at short notice alternatively you could hand back to a remote human operator to, to step in again can they um, understand the situation sufficiently well um, to, to control the vehicle and, and operate it um, appropriately? And can um, you know, all of the issues there around latency and, and the ability to, to understand what's going on from a remote location it makes, makes the challenge even greater? So yeah, certainly challenges around handing back control to, to a human driver. Alternatively, we could allow an automated vehicle not to comply with uh, with the rule but that it would need to offer evidence to, to indicate why that decision was taken um, and and so we need to think about how would it demonstrate that it had it based on its um assessment of the situation that was the the decision it came to around um that it was appropriate to break the rule of the road in this specific scenario that it's encountered and uh, on balance why that was the, the best thing that it should do. And if, if something bad happens, then um, the question there would be around, is the, the vehicle liable for that bad outcome, even because it behaved ethically, it behaved in a way that society, as a society 
we have considered to be appropriate. So that was the kind of conundrum we were facing as a group and um, members of the team that, uh, that were in that safety group came together to write a paper on this. And we were very keen to, to set it in a proper legal context and, and that was why we were very, um, uh, very glad to, to, to be connected with, with Tanya to help us firstly to discuss the topic and then actually Tanya came on board to help us write the paper and, and I think it's a much stronger paper as a result and at that point I think it's time for me to to pass over to Tanya and, and pick up the reins. Tanya. Thanks very much Nick and thanks for, for um, setting that, that foundation and groundwork for what we're going to go on to discuss so well. So I might add to my background as well as being the Dean of Law here I I have a background in legal practice as a solicitor and I have experienced many years ago of turning up in the magistrate's court on, on uh, matters where people were charged with breach of traffic offences, um, et cetera, and so placing that in a criminal law context. And also I've taught criminal law for many, many years and taught um, tort law. And those of us who are joining the webinar from uh, Australia will, I'm sure, be very well aware of the work of the National Transport Commission and their many papers, um, discussion papers and uh, uh, raising issues papers looking at the implications for the laws that might need to change. Uh, and uh, the figure of over 700 comes to, to mind of the sorts of laws that would need to change to accommodate fully automated vehicles on our roads. And of course, as we think about this legal context and before we do a deep dive into some of um, uh, the matters that we discuss in our paper, it, it's important to recognise that uh, the road rules haven't always been there. Um, but that they they were developed when there was a sufficient number of motor vehicles on the road as opposed to horse-drawn uh, vehicles. And so um, governments had to come together and then eventually international bodies came together to create a system of coherent road rules. And the focus for that was safety. How can we keep road users safe? as we're moving from place to place, using our roads, using vehicles, how can we allow people to do that in a way that's safe? And it will be safe if it's predictable, if people um, can expect that other road users will behave in particular ways in particular contexts, that will drive on particular um, sides of the road, that will stop when confronted with particular uh, signs or symbols that we will remain on the road rather than driving elsewhere. And so all of those sorts of things have been incorporated into our road rules and we don't even think about them any longer, they're just there. But in fact, that, that did take some time to develop. So what we've looked at in the paper is two particular areas of law. Um, when should it be considered appropriate to de deviate from expected driving behaviours in the interest of road safety in, the rela in relation to, first of all, exceeding the speed limit and secondly, mounting the curb or leaving uh, the roadway? So Nick, if you can move on to the next slide. We've, we've looked at this in the context of um, the UK legislation. So. This will be new to those of you who uh, aren't in the UK, but the Road Traffic Regulation Act uh, makes it an offence to drive a motor vehicle on a road at a speed exceeding a limit imposed by or under any enactment. Um, now, that is the Act, but the Highway Code for drivers in the UK provides in relation to speed limits, you mu must not drive faster than the speed limit for the type of road and your type of vehicle. But then notice this very interesting point. The speed limit is the absolute maximum. It doesn't mean it's safe to drive at this speed in all conditions. So we have a very uh, interesting situation here where we have one rule that says you must not drive faster than X speed. And we have uh, a highway code that says, yes, but you might not be able to drive at that maximum uh, in all conditions. And for example, here in Australia, we would have, uh, there are various other offences which are like dangerous driving, where even when you're not driving at the maximum speed, you might still be driving in a dangerous manner. 
So there's an element there of human discretion, which is incorporated. And that's discretion which needs to be exercised in the context of physical conditions, roadway, weather, other traffic, other road users, et cetera. If we can move on to the next slide, um, Nick, please. You'll see also that the Road Traffic Act uh, makes it an offence uh, to drive a mechanically propelled vehicle elsewhere other than on roads. But importantly, it, there is what we would call in law a defence there. So you're guilty if you drive a mechanic vehicle uh, on these particular areas, unless, of course, you can prove to the satisfaction of the court and usually in the context of uh, criminal law, that would be beyond reasonable doubt, that it was driven in, in contravention of the section for the purpose of saving life, extinguishing fire, or meeting any other like emergency. So again, we have a firm rule, and then we have, yes, but a human can make uh, decisions about when or when not that rule should be followed. And our next slide, final example of this, is in relation to dangerous driving. So the Road Traffic Act here defines what dangerous driving is. So that there's an offence, if you drive a mechanically propelled vehicle dangerously on a road, then you're guilty of an offence. But how do we know what dangerous driving is? If the way you drive falls far below what would be expected of a competent and careful driver, and those words, of course, incorporate human discretion, uh, and and of course for lawyers that word and is very important. You've got to, you've got to drive in a way that falls far below what would be expected of a competent and careful driver, and it would be obvious to a competent and careful driver that driving in that way would be dangerous. And then if you go on, you see the section 2A there also says that regard, regard shall be had not only to the circumstances of which any driver could be expected to be aware, but any circumstances that they should have known about. And so again, we have an example of a supposedly clear and simple rule that of its very nature incorporates significant amounts of human discretion and words and legal notions that traditionally only can apply to humans. Humans making assessment about what's competent, humans making assessment about what's careful, and they don't do that in the abstract. They have to do that in the context of the situation in which they find themselves, the physical situations uh, and all of the other things that are impacting on um, the driving context. If we can move on, uh, Nick, to the next slide. So what we've seen from just those three fairly simple traffic rules is that even those simple rules embed elements of discretion. And we as human drivers are exercising that sort of discretion all the time without thinking about it to ensure that we're complying with uh, the rules. Now, that poses significant challenges when we're thinking about connected and automated vehicles. What does this mean for how connected and automated vehicles should operate? Circling back to my earlier comments, the traffic rules are designed to ensure safety of road users. And one of the ways that we do that is by making behaviour predictable so that people can expect uh, what would happen. So the challenge then becomes, how should connected and automated vehicles manage these elements of discretion, which often don't appear on the face of the simple rule, but only when you um, dig down into trying to think about how they might apply. And if we can just move on, uh, next slide again, please, Nick. The other challenge to all of this is that, um, Every day, probably every time a human driver gets into a car, uh, there might be moments where technically they are in breach of some of the rules. They might just go over the speed limit for a few moments here or there, or perhaps even a bit longer than a few moments. But we know that not every time we exceed the, 
the speed exceed the speed limit, do we have a police car turning on their siren behind us and stopping us to charge us with an offence? So we know that not all, in, in fact, probably most of the breaches by human drivers don't lead to any sort of traffic rule charges or criminal charges at all. And really, the, the only time someone is likely to be charged is if the breach has been observed directly by or reported to police. And usually that means it's egregious and it's obvious to third parties. If others have been impacted by the breach, even if they may not have seen it, uh, if there have been situations where it's obvious that there has been excessive speed after the event, then that might result in a breach. And very often, if breaches are minor and if they occur in situations where no harm is posed to other people, even if police do observe it, then the police or other road traffic authorities have what is known as prosecutorial discretion. So they might choose to issue an informal warning, a formal warning, there might be counselling about the manner of driving or how the driving could be safer. Now, we as human beings can engage in those conversations, can make assessments, oh, I think I can get away with it or not. But the data uh, in relation to connected vehicles, not even fully automated vehicles, but some of the vehicles now on the road even, uh, changes the game in terms of how we can identify when breaches occur, how we can identify them not only uh, retrospectively, but in real time, potentially, we can identify that this vehicle at this moment is in breach of the law. Um, and so what might that mean for how connected and automated vehicles should operate? What might that mean for decisions about when connected and automated vehicles or just connected vehicles are charged with breaches of traffic offences? Does every time a vehicle exceeds the speed, uh, should that result in, in a charge? Or do you have to exceed the speed by a particular amount of time um, before a charge should be imposed? So what Nick's uh, team did before I uh, joined them is, and if we can move to the next slide, um, Nick, please, is that they have reviewed uh, not only information that has been um, made available by the Law Society of um, the UK, Law Commission, sorry, of the UK, Law Commission of England and Wales, and also by um, a significant number of industry experts. And they have canvassed the views that are um, apparent in the feedback to the Law Commission of England and Wales and also from those industry experts about when it should or should not be allowable to either exceed the speed limit or mount the curb. And the results of looking at those quantitative responses were that there was a hugely wide spectrum of views. So, and this was right across uh, stakeholders in various contexts in industry. So some were of the view that a connected automated vehicle should never be allowed to breach the road rules. Others at the end were, oh yes, it should be allowed to breach it, but breach it only in this very, very specific description. Yes, it can should be allowed to exceed the, the, uh, exceed the speed limit, but only by between five and 10 kilometres per hour in context A, B and C. And then of course, we had a range of views in between those two extremes. So there might be breaches in minimal circumstances where uh, there were general principles where there's no other road users around, et cetera, et cetera. And it's very hard to distill any uniform response from all of that quantitative data, sorry, qualitative data, because the, the range of views was um, really diverse. And when you look at those views, what you can uh, uh, discern from that is that people will respond differently to those questions on the basis of 
how they might assess the level of safety risks posed by any particular breach, uh, who might be impacted by uh, those risks of safety, how reasonable a response is, and of course, reasonable again is another one of those words that uh, implies some human human involvement in the loop, and also they reflected a whole lot of assumptions about the capability of connected and automated automated vehicles, which may or may not be uh, valid. And in fact, in relation to how those vehicles um, might continue to learn in inverted commas, they may well not be valid. So that was one of the issues for us then thinking through how valid are these assumptions and, and can they be tested? If we can move on uh, to the next slide, Nick, please. So thinking through this, and we were uh, we were greatly um, we had huge contribution here from uh, colleague Leon Kester uh, and Marika Martins in their in their understanding of um, autonomous systems and ethics around autonomous systems and thinking about the implications for programmers um, with Paula Pallard. So what becomes evident is programming for strict compliance with traffic rules may not necessarily achieve the outcome that traffic rules are designed to achieve, which is optimal road safety. But at the other end of things, programming for discretion is very, very difficult because it's, it's impossible to anticipate every situation where discretion might need to be exercised. Inevitably, we are talking about situations here that are outliers, that are unexpected, unprecedented. Um, and so how can we predict what they're going to be? And, and designing a, a response about exceeding the speed limit in this context might not be appropriate if we had exactly the same road, exactly the same number of road users, but we had different traffic conditions, for example, or a different time of the day, or if there was the presence of livestock. So um, again, because there are so many different domains and time um, can change things very quickly in one domain, then no training data set could exhaust all possibilities. If we can just move on to the next slide, please. So we're indebted to the work particularly of um, Leon Kester and Marika Martins in these, in these points that we, our paper is making, that AI systems, and I use that word artificial intelligence as an umbrella term, that I, I acknowledge that there's a lot of dispute about what artificial intelligence means and whether in fact it's artificial and will it's, whether it's intelligent. Um, and I think there's a very valid case to say it's neither. <laughs> Um, and we're talking about automation here and algorithms, but I'm going to put all of that put all of that conversation to one side, and we'll just use that umbrella term for now. So, what our paper argues is that um, these systems can't independently learn to derive human values or ambiguous human values about when might it be okay for us to drive a little bit over the speed limit in this context from human behaviour or from human opinion feedback and they can't take what, what a human might consider in one situation and then uh, apply that and translate that to new situations. So uh, we argue in our paper that even if there are sufficiently large training sets available, connected and automated vehicles and the systems that operate them cannot develop from those training sets underlying ethical principles and they can't learn how to, to apply discretion. So one of the, the uh, responses that we argue uh, in our paper needs to be considered is whether ethical goal functions could assist in that space. Now, an ethical goal function, <laughs> uh, I'm new to this as a lawyer, um, but it's, it's uh, a component of the algorithm where we, we're going to uh, rate particular goals having more worth than others. So as Nick said, we're starting to circle right back to the, the generic trolley problem in one sense or another. But then if we say we need these ethical goal functions, then that raises really important questions too. Then how are they going to be developed? By whom? 
And what does that mean for us in liberal democracies? What license is there for governments to make that, for manufacturers to make that? Um, so these become really challenging questions. So I'll hand back to Nick from here. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks, Tanya. And, and I suppose just <clears throat> one final point to, to add to that is if those ethical goal functions aren't being developed by society, then they would be being developed by automated vehicle developers that may have very different pressures um, and very different considerations over how those um, goal functions should should develop. So I think there's there's a tension there over um, how we determine and prescribe behaviour of AVs. Now, uh, one of the the other recommendations that we made, I think, is relevant here, is around metrics for for safety. So I think it's accepted that the introduction of automated vehicles should be associated with a reduction in the risk of harm. Um, and, and we we agreed with that uh, as an expert group, but we also went further to say that um, that no other benefits could compensate for any risk of harm. So if traffic flow were were to increase significantly through the introduction of automated vehicles, but there was a, an associated increase in in risk for pedestrians, say, um, that would be unacceptable. And similarly. If there was no, um, if there was a, a significant improvement in, in uh, there was casualty reduction, but there was a, an increase in casualties for a particular category of road users, again pedestrians or cyclists, some something about the way automated vehicles operate that led to an increase in risk of harm for a particular category of road user. Then, even though there were there was an overall reduction in casualties, that would similarly be considered unacceptable. And we felt there was an opportunity there to um, use the control over the behaviour of automated vehicles to redress some of the inequalities in vulnerability. So we often talk about vulnerable road users. Um, when I walk, when I cycle, I don't consider myself to be a vulnerable road user, but from the perspective of motorised vehicles, uh, I am more, considerably more vulnerable. And so we might be able to use automated vehicles to uh, favour what are considered vulnerable road users in light of the fact that they are indeed more vulnerable. But of course that depends on the ability of the vehicles to detect those categories of road user and respond accordingly. And all of our um, assessments over the appropriateness of the way in which automated vehicles are controlled and operated depends on being able to record suitable data about the safety of their operation. The, the number of near misses, the number of incidents, the number of fatalities that, that actually occur. And not, that's not always um, recorded in the best way currently, for sure. As I mentioned, we, we come back to, to dilemmas. Uh, and again, it's one of the things we, we tackled in the recommendations. The, the trolley problem is, is interesting because you're thinking about a, a specific moment in time when there are two unique options. In our recommendations, we thought, well, that, that's not a realistic reflection of the way in which driving takes place. Driving is a, is a continuous um, activity and uh, a driver is continuously balancing multiple objectives. They're trying to get to their destination on time. Uh, they're trying to um, ensure the safety of themselves and other road users. Um, and it's, it may be the case that dilemma situations do genuinely emerge and in the process of driving. So what we thought from a, an automated vehicle perspective was that if you can look back through the behaviour of the automated vehicle and understand how it arrived at that dilemma situation and then get looking forward, did they behave in, in ways that you would consider acceptable thereafter, after the dilemma had been arrived at, then you could consider the automated vehicle to have behaved in an ethical manner. But again, we would need to have the data about that um, preceding period and, and post the decision to be able to say that, yes, we consider that the automated vehicle had been operated safely and ethically in the event of that particular incident. Now, 
as as has been made clear, I think these um, uh, recommendations depend fundamentally on data. We need to be able to collect it. We need to be able to to share it, um, and it needs to be um, comprehensive in the sense that we can uh, derive the information we need to about how the vehicle is being controlled from the data that's being collected. It's a, it's a fair representation of the way in which the vehicle has been operated. Um, and it needs to be standardized so that if different vehicles are having different types of incident, we can make fair comparisons about their operation, um, even though they might have very different um, means by which they are being uh, controlled and, and operated. So yeah, I think there's there's work to be done in determining how that process of collecting and sharing data might be achieved. And now on that note, going back to, to Tanya to just get, talk us through some of the, the legal implications of that. Yes, yeah, so as I listen to Nick's comments uh, with my legal lens, I'm thinking, okay, let's think about the context in which we might need that data. So, if there is a situation where a connected automated vehicle has apparently breached the road traffic laws, then the way of determining that will be to use and access that data, which will be able to tell us whether the vehicles exceeded the speed limit or not. There might be some observable characteristics about the vehicle's behaviour, where it was on the road, but in terms of speed, it might be that the way that we establish that it has exceeded the speed is uh, to use that data. So, once we start talking about criminal liability for breach of traffic rules, we need to start thinking about the incentives that people might have to contest that. Uh, and there's going to be much greater incentive to litigate or to contest charges uh, if, a criminal, if a criminal penalty attaches to them if there is a fine or potential imprisonment, and particularly when we're talking about dangerous driving uh, and, and the more serious driving offences, then that might be attached to that. Um, but also, if someone charged with an offence uh, believes that there's a lack of clarity around the elements of that offence, or, and perhaps and as well, the elements of that offence incorporate some aspect of human discretion or, dis or elements of discretion or defences that might depend on circumstances, then if I was advising someone who'd been charged with an offence, I would say, let's run it, let's test it. Uh, if it's not clear, let's test it, let's put it to the court, particularly bearing in mind that uh, in the criminal law context, the standard of proof, which has to be proved by the prosecuting authorities, is beyond reasonable doubt in the vast majority of cases. So the stakes rise uh, in terms of more serious breaches and more serious behaviour. And of course, then explainability of the data is crucial. <laughs> And that's, that cycles back to the points uh, that Nick was making before. But if I zoom out even a little bit further, I think it does make me ask some even bigger questions here. What objective is the criminal law as an umbrella concept for traffic rules seeking to achieve here? So is it just to maintain uh, the safety of our road users is it to enforce predictability of behaviour on our roads? If, it's, if, it, if the criminal law in the context of traffic rules is seeking to achieve those objectives, then there are there other options now that we have potentially much greater connectivity between vehicles and infrastructure that we can use to achieve that objective? Do we need to use the criminal law traffic rules uh, lever any longer to achieve those objectives. And what does this mean for our thinking around safety and risk generally? Again, cycling back to that notion around the data. Once we have data about how vehicles have behaved, can we predict future behaviour? Once we have data in real time about risks posed by vehicles, what does that mean for us in terms of how we ensure safety? So. 
I mean, these are these are really challenging and broad questions, um, but I think there is an invitation for us here to think think about what we are using to achieve the objective of safety on our roads, safety for all road users, um, and ensuring that we can move about in our communities in a safe way. Back to you, Nick. Brilliant, thanks, Tanya. And, and just, just to close, really, um, some, some follow-up work um, that I've undertaken with uh, colleagues from the Autonomous Driving Alliance, from PKS Insights, and from the University of Warwick. This was for um, BSI, the British Standards Institution. Um, I, I did a piece of work for them to, under, to, to look at the standards landscape and understand where there are gaps in terms of standards for connected and automated vehicles. And the gap that was identified as being most prominent was that around safety benchmarking. How do you understand safety performance of automated vehicles? So I did some work understanding you know, what, what is the SAE doing? What are um, UNEC doing? What are Waymo doing on uh, how they um, measure the safety of their automated vehicles? Um, and it's 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 certainly not a mature field at the moment. Uh, people are are doing lots of great stuff around um, uh, assessing safety performance, but there's no kind of agreed approach, um, no. Uh, no metric that can be used across different types of automated vehicle to, to make that kind of comparison. So what we proposed as a group, and it, it, it is a proposal at this stage very much, it's, it's something that is in development, is the idea of um, digital commentary driving. So you may have come across commentary driving as a means by which human drivers are, are trained and tested, particularly in advanced driving. So uh, blue light uh, emergency drivers here go through a, a a, a period of, of training and testing it where they describe what they're seeing, how that affects their choices that they're making as drivers in achieving their goal of, of getting to the particular emergency. So driving along, I see a, a speed limit ahead. I see a, a vehicle that looks like it might be about to pull out. I'm going to slow down. I'm going to move the vehicle to avoid that potential hazard. You're giving that kind of narrative description. What digital commentary driving is, isn't asking an automated vehicle to give that narrative description of what it's doing, but how can we record in the data we collect from vehicles enough information to be able to derive the stimuli that the vehicle was detecting, how it was responding to those and how it was choosing to uh, change its behavior. I'm, I'm being very careful of, of my words because Tanya has been very enlightening for us in making sure we're careful not to anthropomorphize uh, automated <laughs> But um, but yeah, that, just if you allow me for this one slide, um, yeah, what, what is the vehicle seeing? What is it deciding? How is it choosing to act in that particular situation? So can we collect data um, to be able to, to do that in a way that protects the commercially sensitive elements of an automated vehicle's control systems? So we, we um, sense, we, we, we know that an automated vehicle will, will need to be um, producing information about where it is, what it's seeing, and what it's planning to do. So is there a, 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 a technology agnostic way of collecting that data and being able to assess um, its performance, its safety performance on that um, basis? And that's what we call digital commentary driving. Again, that, that report is published and, and is available at the link, and I'm sure the slides will be shared um, after the presentation. So yeah, really just to, to close, we need that kind of industry standard around the way in which we collect data you know, more broadly um, around road safety, but in specifically related to, to automated vehicles. The, the protocols need to be there so we can share data and um, in ways that res are respectful of commercial sensitivities of, of IP, but that enable us to make those comparisons um, and, and understand road risk much more um, in much greater depth in the way that Tanya has described. And then that clarity around the ethical goals for automated driving, and that needs engagement from society, from, from the ministers, from um, the technology developers, to make sure that um, the, the vehicles we end up delivering are behaving in ways that we all consider to be safe and ethical. And I think that's, that's what we all hope to achieve. So um, yeah, with that, 
thanks very much to, to Tanya for helping us in, in the paper and, and for um, support in this presentation. Um, mm. To our fellow authors of the, the paper, um, and we very much welcome your, your questions, comments, and the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Nick and Tanya. Um, that was really amazing. So just clarify that paper hasn't been published yet. Is that right? It's, it's uh, not published yet? It is due any minute. We are, we are awaiting the final um, version to, to come out. It's been accepted. It's with the publishers. The, 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 they're, they're starting the printing presses. It's, uh, it'll be with us any, any minute now. And congratulations on that collaboration. Um, it's great to connect you and also to that you wanted to work together as well. So uh, one thing to introduce people, the other part is to be able to want willing to work together. So that's great. We've got lots of questions um, and it's across a whole range of things. Um, I think one of the first things around, you know, the international road rules and the fact that road rules are different all over the world and attitudes are different all over the world. And how do you see these sorts of work happening and informing uh, and maybe being translated globally for some consistency? Um, do you see that there's mechanisms in place currently or is there a gap? I'll, Nick, do you want to speak I'll... about the European situation first? Yeah, I'll start on that. Well, when, when we think about the, the ethical goal functions, we certainly re reflect that there will be differences between um, countries in the way they might choose automated vehicles to operate. There might be differences in um, between cities and other regions in the way they want automated vehicles to operate. And um, we would want uh, the, uh, the vehicles to be able to reflect those differences and you know, be able to you know, kind of live um, update the, the, their behaviours to reflect the um, location in which they're being operated. Um, and yeah, the, I don't see there being a, a, an easy mechanism by which that can be achieved currently. Um, but it's part of the learning process. I think you know, as we see um, connectivity and automation growing, it, it's going to be part of um, the way in which we regulate the operation of automated vehicles, that ability for their behavior to be updated. Similarly, you know, if we found that we weren't happy with the way in which they were being controlled and we wanted them to, to adopt lower risk, um, or, or we see the safety form was excellent and we can afford a higher um, risk appetite. Um, those kind of adaptations can be made as well and, and through through that agreed process through you know updating of, of those goal functions those kind of things can be achieved and what, one final point on that different manufacturers might choose to operate their vehicles in different ways some of them might be the ultimate driving machine some of them might be the the safest driving machine and provided they don't exceed the limits of those ethical goal functions that's fine too you know, you, you, you uh, a manufacturer might choose different risk appetites um, in the way their, their vehicles operate. Um, so yeah, but yeah, lots to do in terms of a, a regulated mechanism by which that can be achieved. Tanya, sorry. Uh, and what I would say is that uh, we may not have all the solutions for that, but this is a question that needs to be asked. So I mean, I think there's quite a bit of literature out there already around advanced driver assistance systems in cars on the road already about how some of those systems have been calibrated uh, by developers in one country and then they apply very differently in other driving contexts. Now, uh, if we're moving to uh, fully automated vehicles, whether they have human passengers or not, we're going to need to have a conversation about how those vehicles are calibrated and whether that there is an international agreement about that or whether uh, that's country by country, region by region. I mean, we in Australia have a different situation to Europe where there are, you know, it's very easy to drive from one country to another country to another country to another country. Here, I have to say, even things like differing speed limits, um, maximum speed limits in states in Australia can be confusing for drivers. So we do need to think uh, as we're starting to, to build this platform for the technology about consistency and coherency. 
So thanks for that. Um, one of the things, obviously, your backgrounds are very different. Um, and I would see this as being, you know, here we are in court and we've got a legal argument and we've got an expert coming in. But the expert opinions are so varied, as you said, Nick, with, um, you know, the different opinions. Uh, if we don't get this sort of structure and, and guidance to the people developing the technology right, we will end up in court, you know, for years and potentially people who are injured. I mean, ultimately, that's the issue that somebody's injured and we might have this drawn out, long drawn out court case uh, trying to actually support the person that's injured um, by just having this argument. Do you see that there's is there a mechanism that we can sort of look after the person, say, that's injured, whether it's property or personally injured, whilst this sort of um, technology is in its infancy? And maybe uh, if you want to comment on what's happening in the US with the NHTSA investigations as well, which is sort of playing out um, in that regard. So, Tanya and then Nick? Yeah, so, so first of all, in response to your question, I think it's really important to keep the criminal law separate from the civil law. So what we've been talking about is the criminal law and breaches of particular legislative rules, all right? Um, and and that's about the, the coercive power of the state prosecuting an individual to say, you have breached the law and therefore we will impose a penalty on you of some sort. Now, that's a very different area of the law to someone saying, I have been injured, the cause of my injury is somebody else and I want to compensate, I want them to compensate me. Now, that's where the role of insurance becomes critical and accident compensation mechanisms become critical. Um, we haven't addressed that in our presentation today. The UK's Automotive and Electri Electrical and Automotive Technologies uh, Act deals with that and basically says the insurer is liable. Um, I haven't got the name of the act quite right about that, but there's a very different, that's a very different context. Um, but I agree with you that the first pieces of litigation, whether they're in the criminal law context or they are the civil law compensation context, um, are likely to be incredibly complex. They are likely to be very high stakes because they will um, potentially create precedent. And we're gonna to need to think very carefully about how we manage complex scientific evidence in those. And I suspect that in the, in the, in the accident case, um, the risks of litigation will be so high that there'll be lots of negotiations going on, I would say. Um, yeah. Yeah. It I agree, Tanya, and, and yeah, Automated Electric Vehicle Act 2018 is, is the yes. one, and, and you're exactly Thank right, it, it, it's the insurer that yep. compensates the injured party, and then the, it, the insurer goes, um, yep. um, seeks the, 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 the compensation from um, yep. the responsible um, organisation. Um, on the, 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 the NHTSA investigation, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued, really, because I think a lot of the, the information in the letter, the data that's being required, is exactly the sorts of things we're talking about in digital commentary driving. If 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 there had been that um, standardised form of data collection in place, there wouldn't be Tesla engineers scrambling around now, probably currently trying to to um, collate all that data and provide it in a form to NHTSA in a way that um, can be understood and 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 analysed appropriately. I mean, even if Tesla can provide that data, does, does NHTSA have the capability and, and the engineers to be able to, to process it and analyse it um, uh, in, in, in an appropriate manner and in an appropriate time frame even? Um, so yeah, some sorts of standardisation around the way we collect and analyse data to, to be able to determine liability, to be able to um, understand the risks that automated vehicles pose, I think is going to be vital and, and we'll need new um, new structures, new new organisations to be able to do that. Um, thanks for that. Um, we've got another question here that talks about, are we right, do we need to rewrite road rules for robots rather than humans? 
Um, is it, do we need to recast the thinking around safety and the safety of this technology? Uh, so to that point, it's, um, if I can add some commentary, the discretionary uh, nature of the road rules and the way we drive as humans may be contributing to the thousands and hundreds and thousands of people who die on our roads every year. So if we try and introduce discretionary behaviour into something, uh, a system that could be better, are we going to maybe end up with not having the safety benefits? Um, so in general, uh, you know, uh, do we, are we using a premise that's uh, probably flawed because we're using the existing road rules that are, you know, the premise is human drivers? Um, and also this discretionary nature, is that potentially a risk uh, into uh, introducing crashes uh, into this system? So I don't know who wants to go first. Yeah, if I'll, either of you, I'll, want, yeah, Tanya. I'll, I'll attack that. So um, I think the law in all of its forms recognises that humans are never perfect and that humans make all sorts of decisions, you know, under pressure, from inattention, et cetera. And so the law in, in almost every context incorporates our humanness. And that was why I asked uh, at, towards the end of my, my major presentation is what objective are our road rules trying to achieve? Because our road rules are saying to human beings, this is how you can interact safely with other human beings using bits of machinery effectively on the road, right? Whereas if we have pieces of machinery that will only ever behave in exactly the way that they are programmed to behave, do we need road rules? <laughs> you know. How do we achieve the objective that we're trying to achieve, which is to keep everyone using this, this infrastructure safe? Uh, and so I, I think it is an opportunity for us to think about not the law not being necessarily the driver of our behaviour, but code as law as a driver of behaviour, pun intended there, driver. Um, and I think it, you know, it does. It does actually open up for us a really interesting question about whether law is the right lever to pull here um, to achieve the objective, which is safety. I'm not sure if you've got any comments on that, um, Nick. Uh, yeah, I, the only thing I'd add is, is the, the the situation that often came up in in our discussions was um, whether a vehicle could go up onto the the curb to allow an emergency vehicle to pass and. You know, it, it, someone whose emergency was not being dealt with because the ambulance was waiting for an automated vehicle that refused to get out of the way. Um, you know, you know, I can see similar kind of tragic um, responses in or tragic outcomes in that situation as well. So, um, yeah, I, I think um, it would be for the reasons we've talked about. It's very difficult to write a, a, a rule set that would account for all of the variability that might be encountered in driving situation. Therefore, we need to develop um, that discretion, but it, it needs to come from um, a societal perspective, not just from mm. those of a, of a developing organisation. I'm just mindful of time, and I do want to finish on time. It's all various times around the globe. Um, we do have one comment uh, and a quick uh, response from both of you. Um, the, the commentary is, if there is a standard for CAV coding in a country or state in accordance with a standard, then would that not reduce the amount of variance in risk and the cause and consequence we see with human drivers? Um, meaning we may see a lot of the same types of errors or crashes or consequences, which may mean, you know, this regulatory management model, road management, safety management and network design may be different. So it's a bit of a, it's a, you know, posing a scenario and a question. You have thoughts on that? For me, uh, the the standardisation isn't about how automated driving is achieved. It's about the data that's collected from it. So you can, you're you're at liberty to use any type of sensor, any type of artificial intelligence um, in the operation of the vehicle. But the data that you collect um, must be produced in a similar manner. So in effect, what you're doing is, is having the ability to tap the, sh the shoulder of the AV, and I'm going to anthropomorphize again, apologies, Tanya. <laughs> tap the shoulder of the AV and say, what can you see now? What are you planning to do next? Uh, and and what and satisfy yourselves that that is um, 
acceptable. Um, and that, to me, that seems to be uh, a fair way to um, evaluate whether automated vehicles are, are being operated in a way that is considered acceptable um, in the society. And I would just add, Rita, that I think the, the for the vast majority of driving behaviour, um, we can all agree that you drive at a particular speed in this in this speed limited zone, that you stop for these events, that this sign means that a vehicle behaves in a particular way. I think what, what we're talking about here in terms of exceeding the speed limit or mounting the curb are two examples of what you might call outlier events, where, where we're going to have to consider whether or not it's okay for a vehicle to go outside of the normal expected uh, routine behaviours and that and those those outlier events, the unprecedented, the unexpected, the ones that we don't plan for, they are going to be posing particular challenges. Look, thank you so much. We could just keep talking all day and all night, uh, depending on where everybody is in the world. Um, it's really exciting. I think we are really scratching the surface. I want to um, acknowledge uh, Tanya and Nick, your time in working together on this and presenting to our collaboration. Also, Tanya, you're going to be speaking at the Advi Summit on one of our panels to do with a whole range of topics. So I encourage you all, if you haven't um, go onto our website and register to be uh, to attend the virtual summit. So anywhere you are in the world, um, and that's going to be on the 18th and 19th of October. So thank you again. Thank you to everybody that joined in. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, we will get to them. We'll share them with the speakers, and then um, hopefully we'll be able to respond to those. Um, have a good day and a good night wherever you are, and look forward to speaking to you again at our next seminar. Thank you.